Before I do that, I really want you to kind of understand how we get heavy metals out of your body. So when, when we're doing the chelation treatment, when we're doing the provocation treatment, we're administering drugs. And you can see these drugs down here. And I specifically use that word drugs because this is one of the few things in functional medicine where we use drugs and there is no counterpart. There is no natural version. It is a drug. It is a man-made chemical. And the three man-made chemicals that currently exist are EDTA, DMPS, and DMSA. There are others, and I think there's some down the pipeline, but those are the three most common pharmaceutical versions that you can find. And so what you're dealing with is you have all these heavy metals that are stored in your brain, your liver, your heart, your bone, and we need to get it out of your body. So the three ways to get it out of your body are urine, sweat, and stool. When we're administering these drugs, 95% of it, give or take, I don't remember the, the statistic perfectly, but the majority of it, vast 90%, comes out through the urine. So whenever you take the pill orally or when you swallow or when, whether you inject it, it doesn't matter. It's going to get absorbed into the bloodstream. It's going to go all around the body, um, questionably into the brain because it's difficult to, to um, get through that blood brain barrier. But it's going to pick up a metal of some sort, whether it's a beneficial metal or a bad metal. And it's going to carry itself through the bloodstream. It's going to land in the kidneys at some point. 20% of your blood ends up in your kidneys. And as soon as it circulates enough time through the body, it will hit the kidneys and then it will end up in the urine. And now you have officially gotten rid of that metal. So um, the other ways to get rid of metals are, of course, through your sweat and stool. But oddly enough, sweat is your second best way to get rid of heavy metals. Stool is not really a great way to get rid of heavy metals. I see all the time people talking about taking um, uh, binders like GID, or, well, we call it GI detox, but charcoal, clay, um, zeolite. Um, all, all kinds of binders. And the truth is you can take as many binders as you want inside and, and swallow them and keep them inside the intestine and poop them out. But you can only bind what's available in there. So unless you're eating lead, those binders aren't really going to do anything because you've got to get the metals from the organs into the place of the intestines in order to detoxify them. And as I told you earlier, the body is not really designed to eject these metals. It's designed to hold on and accumulate metals because it's designed to absorb magnesium and selenium and molybdenum and iron and all those. So it doesn't really know how to get rid of the bad heavy metals. It doesn't know the difference between them. So now rarely is your body actually ejecting heavy metals into the intestines for stool. So this is not a detox process where we're heavily focusing on the stool, although you always need to be taking the trash out every day. You must have a daily bowel movement and we must support those other detox pathways that I've got listed down here. But primarily with chelation, we're talking about urine. Now, cadmium is a very unique one that seems to be kind of odd. Cadmium loves to come out in the sweat. And if you ever talk to the, the sauna um, salespeople, which I do because I'm in this business, the sauna salespeople will, cl will commonly pull out a, a, a study that showed, oh, sauna pulls out X amount of cadmium compared to not doing anything at all in the sweat. So cadmium loves to come out of the sweat. So, But it doesn't really matter if you're sweating in a sauna or sweating outside in this Texas heat. It doesn't matter where you're sweating. As long as you're sweating, you are actively removing toxins and actively removing cadmium. So that's a great way to get it out. Um, I, I, I there's a, this is kind of a, a not an unstudied lame test, but one of the things I frequently encourage my patients to do is when they first start sauna or some sort of sweat therapy, they need to get a plain white towel and they need to dry themselves off while they're sweating. And once they're done, hang it up and let it dry and not wash or anything, let it dry. And if little black spots appear, that could mean that you're eliminating some sort of environmental toxin through your sweat, or it could mean that you're eliminating cadmium and it rusted. If those black spots appear, it says that you've detoxed something, eliminated something, because never should your black, your, your sweat turn black on a towel. Now, if you leave it in a damp, humid room, maybe it got moldy, but if it did officially dry and it oxidized, it's likely to turn up black spots. The reason I encourage you to do that, because in the long run, you can repeat that test with another white towel, and if there's less black spots and it says, hey, you're making progress, you have less inside you, it's a cheap, easy way to determine if sauna is working for you. Now, if... Um, if black spots don't appear, that doesn't mean nothing came out. It just, that test didn't work for you. Um, that is not a study test. We call it the white towel experiment. Um, so as, as far as the, the, the urine is concerned, most metals don't really come out in the urine unless they're provoked with drugs. And so before we do a provocation test, we always collect a random sample. That random sample is before someone takes any drugs or, or detox support. Then we see what the body is naturally eliminating. It's almost always very little. And then we do the provocating agent. 
whether it be EDTA, DMP, SDMSA, which we'll get to, um, we see much more come out in the urine. And that kind of proves that the human was not eliminating it on their own, but they have a great storage of it. And now they're eliminating with the drug. Um, so the urine requires help. The sweat doesn't require help. And then the stool is mostly pointless in the heavy metal world. People may disagree. You're welcome to, but that's my opinion uh, right now. So let's get into the testing. I, I kind of mentioned that I'm dancing around. I apologize. Um, but as far as the testing, the, the only way to test for heavy metals, the only way to test for heavy metals is with a urine before challenge and a urine after challenge. So we call this provocation or a provoked urine. You cannot do hair. Hair analysis is a lame way to check for heavy metals. If you have heavy metals in your hair, you probably do legitimately have a problem. But if you do not have heavy metals in your hair, it means nothing. Okay. So all you women stop cutting off your hair or pulling on hair follicles to do this test because it's not worth it. You're, you, you can only tell if you've been exposed to heavy metals based on the growth of that hair. So if you were exposed to heavy metals while that hair was growing, you will see that metal in the hair. But if you were exposed to it 30 years ago, like this lady from New Orleans, and well, it was a little more than 30 years ago, but if you were exposed a long time ago before that hair was growing, chances are you won't see high levels in that hair. And unless your hair is long enough to have years worth of, of data, then it's really not worth doing. So hair is old school. It's what it's all people had for a while. So by all means, all the practitioners that were doing this before we had this fancy testing, great, good for you. Hair needs to go out, stop doing it. It's only urine and it's only provoked or provocation or challenge urine, however you want to look at it. And then I'm making a note here that no fish before you do a challenge test or any kind of heavy metal testing, no fish, shellfish, anything from the ocean, fish and shellfish, even the most organic, wild caught, clean has mercury in it. And so when you're doing this testing, you don't want to know what mercury you just ate and urinated out. You want to know what metal you had inside of you. So in general, you want to avoid as many metals as possible, specifically mercury, before you do your challenge testing. That way, you know, okay, it came out of me because it was stored inside me, not because I just ate it. So always avoid fish. We, I used to say seven days. Now, apparently 48 hours is good enough, but that's a no questions asked, um, no substitutions allowed, must not have fish or shellfish for 48 hours. So the provoke testing, the way we do it in our office, the most um, effective method, in my opinion, is to do an IV infusion with the drugs in order to stimulate the metals out. So the way this works is two days before, 48 hours before, no fish or shellfish. Then the patient comes in and we do some routine testing to make sure they're safe for chelation. Uh, EKG, we already have some lab work based on, on their uh, profile, kidney function, blood counts and all that. And then we do the infusion. It is a long infusion. EDTA is one of the more dangerous components that we use. You must, your practitioner, whoever you may be using, must be using calcium disodium EDTA. I will quickly refer to it as EDTA, but you must be using calcium disodium EDTA. It's the, so the downside to EDTA is that it has killed people, unfortunately. Why has that happened? It's happened because EDTA loves to grab calcium. And unfortunately, your body needs calcium and cannot survive without it. And so if you drop your calcium levels too quickly, your heart stops. And that's generally regarded as not good in medicine or in life in general. So if you give EDTA without calcium, then it's going to steal your own body's calcium and you may run low. If you give EDTA too fast, you will steal the calcium too fast, drop your calcium levels and bad things happen. Now, there's plenty of warning signs before all that happens. But if you give calcium disodium EDTA, then you're already giving some calcium with the EDTA. So even if the EDTA is taking up some calcium, it has to release the calcium molecule that it's already attached to in order to grab another calcium molecule. So it's considered an even swap and um, very safe to do calcium disodium EDTA. We infuse it very slowly. The fastest you can infuse an adult dose of calcium disodium EDTA is an hour and a half. We sometimes stretch ours out to two, two and a half hours. We would rather take longer and you'd be bored than you'd be dead. Um, that's our general opinion. So the infusion takes a while. The EDTA component by itself is a minimum of an hour and a half. And then we infuse DMPS, about 250 milligrams IV. Um, DMPS also comes in an oral version, but I found that doing the IV version is way better. The reason why is because I've dosed people with DMPS um, orally and got some ambiguous results or results that I didn't really believe. And I think what's going on is when you swallow it orally, it already has a poor absorption. You only absorb about 50% of the drug, which means 50% is staying in the bowels and 
And remember, we're not collecting any stool. So even if there are metals in the bowels, you're not collecting the stool or collecting the urine to see what comes out. So any drug that you don't absorb stays in the bowel, stays in the stool, and you've missed it, and it didn't catch any metals. So the, the amount of drug you absorb goes into your bloodstream, goes around your body, grabs the metal, ends up in the urine. But it just seems to be a lower power than when, in, when administered IV. So when I'm doing my challenge testing, I want to eliminate as many variables as possible. So what I do is I do two IV drugs, EDTA and DMPS, and then we collect the urine for six hours. The DMPS IV takes about 45 minutes. Risks are low blood pressure. Um, but the, the as long as it's slow, it's, it's much safer than EDTA. It's not nearly as dangerous. The low blood pressure is usually transient. As soon as you slow it down or stop, the, the blood pressure returns to normal. Um, and so when you give those two IV drugs, you then collect the urine for six hours because while you're infusing those drugs, those drugs are flowing through your body, hopefully to the brain. But remember, there's that blood-brain barrier that makes it trickier. And then it's getting back in the bloodstream, and then it's getting to the kidneys, and you're dumping it all in the kidneys. The majority of these drugs go in and come out completely unchanged. They don't really tax the liver, per se, because they don't require a lot of detoxification. They go in and they come out unchanged with a metal bound to them. Sometimes they bind calcium, sometimes they bind zinc, selenium, manganese. Sometimes they bind whatever metals are in you. So we collect six hours worth of urine. Your infusion should have been done hours before we stop collecting the urine. Once you collect all that urine, then we send it off. We send a small sample of it off to the lab to be analyzed, and they come back and tell us how much metals, how many metals you urinated out when we gave you the drug versus how many metals you urinated out without the drug. And basically, that can tell us what you have stored inside you. So if you eliminate 150 lead, like this lady from New Orleans, then you pretty much know that you've got a lot more lead inside you because if that much came out, you've just got buckets stored all over your body. So it's going to take repeat treatments. Um, one of the questions is always, how many treatments will it take? And of course, it depends on how many metals you have on board. A standing number seems to be 30 treatments. Um, that seems to be a, a reasonable one. But of course, if, you're, if your levels are lower, you won't require 30. Um, and you certainly don't have to do all 30 IV.